Hey everybody, welcome back to Recordology. Boy, am I excited to share with you something that is just, I can't wait, I cannot wait. So, um, cat's out of the bag a little bit already. Um, so we are going to be reviewing a 1917 Vita Nola phonograph um, and, you know, 102 years old and, you know, in near perfect condition, full of working order. We're going to take a full top to bottom look. Um, for, if you want to learn how this amazing blessing came into my life, check out last week's um, Recordology Express midweek show last Wednesday. And I give you guys a whole rundown of how I came to own this thing. And I am just so excited to share it with you guys. And I hope you enjoyed as much as I do. So let's take a look. Welcome to Recordology. All right, guys, and here it is. This is a 1917 Vita Nola made in Chicago, Illinois. So Vita Nola was around from about 1915 to 1925. About the end of the teens, there was an explosion in companies that made phonographs, and that's because the Edison and Victrola patents started to expire. The woodworking on this unit is just exquisite. Vita Nola was sort of a mid-range phonograph, so most people could afford it, but this unit sold for about $100 back in 1917. Adjusted for inflation, that would be about $2,000 today. In the bottom of this cabinet, there's shelves for storage of records. And it's important to note, and something that somebody recently told me, is that these older acoustic units should only play older acoustic records. So records made after 1925, which unfortunately constitutes much of what you see here, shouldn't be played on this because it can damage the reproducer. They're just not designed to play back such dynamic grooves that were recorded with the newer technology. I've also seen some information that suggests that these shelves originally had drawers that used to be in them. However, those are long gone. The attention to detail in the wood crafting here is just phenomenal. Surprisingly, these were usually made out of a veneer, which is sort of a predecessor to plywood. However, some corner pieces and trim units would have been solid wood, and usually that wood was mahogany. Okay guys, and for the big reveal, let's look under the hood. Isn't that beautiful? Let's take a look in closer detail. All right, let's start back here at the label. As I said, Vita Nola. This is a Model 100, and for Vita Nola, the model numbers represented the price. So the 100 was $100, the 125 was 125. Okay, so here is the reproducer and tone arm assembly, and it's in remarkably good shape. There is a little bit of denting along some parts of it that looks like they were repaired over the years, but still, it works phenomenally well. This unit is actually designed to play both horizontal grooves and vertical hill and dale grooves. So older Edison uh, type discs, you can play with this as well. So for a regular record such as this, you would place the uh, reproducer on just like that. But if you had a, an Edison disc, for example, you would rotate it like this, and it would ride those grooves up and down. Now, while we're here, let's take a look at the reproducer in closer detail. There's the steel needle down there. I have some replacements, and you have to replace the needle after every single play. It's attached to the reproducer surface itself, which in this case is made out of mica. Some of the Vita Nola units actually said Vita Nola right there. It may be missing an overlay. I'm not 100% sure. This unit's in pretty good condition. It looks to me like it was rebuilt in the last 10 to 20 years, which is about how often they have to be rebuilt with new gaskets, rubber parts, and things of that nature. So I was blessed with not only this unit itself, but a bunch of needles. And the advertising for the needles, the replacement needles, is fantastic. Guaranteed to play 10 records. Like I said earlier, you're really supposed to change it out each side of a record. Um, and it's amazing once they go dull, because it's just a blunt steel needle, uh, putting a new one on does make a dramatic difference. Plus, it's going to save those records as well. Now, obviously, you can only play 78 RPM records with a wide groove. 
while we're over here, here's the uh, speed adjust from slow to fast. And I will show you in a minute because we're actually going to take this apart and look inside and see how it works. This is actually a fantastic mechanism for adjusting the speed. If it's a little too slow, a little too fast. Obviously, this is completely acoustic. There's no electrical parts whatsoever. Everything is run off of a spring motor. So adjustments can be made when the speed just isn't quite right. And you have to tune it to your ear. And over here on the right hand side is the brake mechanism, which is essentially the start and stop. To play a record, once it's wound, you just move it to the right. Sometimes it helps to give the record a little bit of a spin and then to stop it and lock it in position, you just move this to the left. Okay, and over on the right here, we have the crank. So you turn it clockwise a few turns to wind it up. You wanna make sure that you don't over crank that or you can break the springs. That's gonna be an expensive fix. So it's better if you under crank it and have to do it in the middle of the song a little bit more versus going to town and then damaging something. And over here is the volume control. So when you pull that out or push it in, it changes the volume if you can believe that. And it makes a big difference. And this thing is amazingly loud. Okay, and here is the cloth that covers the opening where the sound comes out. If you lift this piece up and then gently pull it down, you can see inside there, that is a plywood horn. Uh, some of the horns were made out of metal, um, but a lot of people uh, actually think these plywood horns, these wood horns, had some very good tonal qualities and are actually desirable. So it's amazing craftsmanship because this is actual pressure and moisture bent wood that is steamed to form these curves. Now, the horn goes into a tube that comes out the top in that shiny piece that we were looking at on top. So this can be cleaned out very easily. Uh, the cloth can be cleaned and re-glued like I did. And then to put it back, you just lift this up and set it back down, pretty easy. So completely acoustic, the stylus, which feels the vibrations in the grooves, transfers and transmits those vibrations to the mica surface. Now that mica surface causes the air to vibrate and create sound waves that bounce around through this tube as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it comes out that wooden horn in the front completely amplified and filling the room. So let's go ahead and give it a listen. Okay, we are going to be listening to a Columbia record. This was recorded acoustically. This record is a little bit dirty, so I am going to dust it off and then we're gonna give it a listen. I'm gonna turn the crank a few times. I know that it's already wound pretty well. I'm gonna move this knob out about halfway for the sound. I think you'll be really surprised at how loud it is. Now, I know it's gonna be hard to tell on the video, but this is actually a very loud unit. <laughs> it easily fills up the room. And when you listen to this, you guys, it's so awesome because it's a time machine to an earlier time. These completely acoustic recordings, acoustic sound waves, no electricity required, and we are gonna step back in time. So let's go ahead and give Roses of Piccadilly a listen. We're gonna go ahead and move this to the right, and it's okay to give it a little bit of a spin to get going. That way the motor doesn't have to start it from scratch. And speed-wise, I'm gonna start this right in the middle. If we hear that the pitch is a little bit off, we'll adjust it. But let's go ahead and gently lower the reproducer and new needle right onto the record surface. Give it a little help to find that first groove. Okay guys, just like I said, it's a complete time machine. Now, what's really neat is you can easily access the inner workings of this unit. And in so doing, uh, the first time I, I looked in here, I was blown away at the quality and the condition that the unit was in. So in order to do that, um, and I've, I've researched you know, the best way to do this, but if you lift up on the edge of the turntable here, there's a wood, platform underneath it. Now, B 
before you try to access the inner workings, you have to unscrew the crank counterclockwise several times, then it'll pop right off, thus freeing the inner workings and allowing you to open them up pretty easily. Sometimes a platter likes to go freewheeling like that and you just need to put the brake on. And then you just lift up on the edge of the platter like that and this wood piece uh, will lift right up and then you pull it back like this and the whole thing, the motor and everything is self-contained under this plank. Now look at that you guys, that is in remarkable condition considering that this thing is 102 years old. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at it right here. I apologize for the handheld camera here, but look at the grease is still there and it's moist and it's not dried out like a lot of these get. You'll see two sections to the motor and that indicates two springs. And you do not want to have to wind those and repair those. So I was very thankful that this was in such good condition. Um, but they play off each other when they're wound and when they unwind. What does that say? The motor? That is really, really cool, guys. 102 years old. Now, do you remember that speed control that we looked at? This is what it connects to. So this arm connects to that knob. When you turn it one way or another, those weights will actually push away from or pull closer to the shaft, and that impacts the speed of the record. Now look down inside this opening, you guys. You can see like handwriting, you can see some glue, you can see where the horn attaches to the shaft that connects to the tone arm, but you're not gonna see dust, you're not gonna see any dead mice, and that is actually phenomenal considering the age. This thing is immaculate. All I had to do was put a little bit of oil on it, a little bit of furniture polish. This thing was in great condition. So very thankful to have it. I hope you enjoyed this look at the Vita Nola phonograph from 1907, the, or 1917, the Model 100. Um, and you know, if you have a phonograph like this, and it's not a record player, it's a phonograph. If you own one, uh, and there was, you know, hundreds of different manufacturers. I mean, look at this on the screen now. I'm showing you several of the different competitors to the Victrola and the Edison. There were literally between two and four hundred different companies, each focusing on different aspects of the musical experience and often touting their equipment as musical instruments, not just record players or phonograph players but fine furniture, which they are, and an intricate part of that listening experience. Keep in mind, the idea of listening to a recording was completely new to most people. The novelty of being able to hear Caruso or somebody of that stature in your own home was an investment that they were willing to make. Again, $100 in 1917 is roughly $2,000 in 2019. So, you know, they were a big investment and the advertising for this one specifically said it was designed to last a generation. So I would say that's, you know, what is that, 30, 35 years? And here it is 102 years later and essentially in perfect condition, working just as it did off the showroom floor that day. Not much is known about the Vita Nola company uh, other, other than the fact that they lasted longer than most of those two to 400 phonograph companies some of which went out of business in a matter of a couple of months. Uh, but they had some longevity and uh, they made a very quality product. It's not something you'll find, uh, but man, this is the true essence of record archeology, span you guys. And I am so thankful to have this unit. We're gonna see a lot of this on the show in the coming weeks and months and years. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, definitely give me a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Tell me about what you have. I'd be fascinated to hear about it. Okay guys, and there it is, the Vita Nola 1917 phonograph, model 100. If you wanna get your Vita Nola 100, check out my Amazon link below. Actually, nah, that's not gonna work, you guys know that. Um, but seriously, if you're interested in an antique phonograph, um, they are very, they're not hard to come by. Um, they're very hard to come by in the way that I was able to, uh, very blessed. Um, thankful not expecting that at all but it's odd because this is what started my interest in record players in, uh, in to begin with was uh, antique phonographs 
um, you know, like the Victrola guys channel. I definitely recommend you checking that out. It's really good. what got me started on all of this. Uh, but anyway, and I keep looking at it. I just love it. I can't stop looking at it. Uh, but definitely appreciate you being along for the ride. But if you want to get one for yourself, uh, Craigslist is a good place to look. Uh, eBay would probably be more expensive. Uh, it may be better for smaller ones like uh, tabletop, desktop ones. But for large cabinet ones like that, I would recommend antique stores and Craigslist and let go. Uh, if you haven't tried let go, it's kind of an interesting way to sell and buy stuff like that. Um, but you know, you could probably get one in rough condition for maybe $150 and then on up. If you have an off-brand unit like this one, uh, you can get a lot more for your money. Uh, but if you have a Victrola or an Edison one, it's gonna cost you five, six hundred dollars for a, one that's in good working order. So it's it's a fun thing. It's rare to find them in good condition like this. I really didn't do any work. All the credit goes to the previous owners who uh, took good, good care of it. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show anyway. And maybe you're glad you don't have one and it's just fun to watch on video. And that's kind of how I started too. It's like, well, I just, just resigned myself. I'm never going to own this, but I can just vicariously, you know, watch these types of things on YouTube. So if that's what this is all about for you, then uh, more power to you. That's an awesome way to do it. Happy to be a part of that, guys. Check us out uh, throughout the week, new content. We also are um, we're on uh, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. Uh, if you haven't done so already, hit subscribe, would you please? That would really help us out. Share this with your friends. If you know other people that might be interested in old photographs like this, share it out on whatever platform you can. I would really appreciate that. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Welcome to the people that are just seeing us for the first time. Uh, but as always, guys, happy record hunting. We will see you next time. Now you can follow Recordology on Instagram and Twitter. Follow us at Recordology1938 today. Make sure to subscribe to both Instagram and Twitter because we will feature unique content on each platform. Happy record hunting now on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm not very good at this. Neither am I. Okay, what did we lose? Thank you for watching Recordology Deluxe. Don't forget to subscribe and watch our midweek show Recordology Express on Wednesdays.